Yeah, so that's one thing I'd recommend is the is the books books about the from the original people, especially Heisenberg, about the how that happened. And there's also a very, very good kind of history of of the kind of what happened during this 20th century in physics and you know, up to the time of the standard model in 1973. It's called the um, the second creation by um Bob Kreese and uh, and Mann. That's one of the best ones. I know that's but the the one thing that I can say is that so that book I think forget when it was late eighties nineties <laughs> the problem is that there just hasn't been much that's actually worked out since then so <laughs> most of the books that are kind of trying to tell you about all the glorious things that have happened since nineteen seventy three are they're mostly telling you about how glorious things are which actually don't really work and it, it's really the argument people sometimes make in term in, in favor of these books is well, oh, you know, they're they're really great because you want to do something that will get kids excited, and then you know, so they're getting excited about things something that's not really quite working. It's doesn't really matter. The main thing is get them excited. The, the other argument is, you know, wait a minute. When if you're getting people excited about ideas that are wrong, you're really kind of you're actually kind of discrediting the whole scientific enterprise in a, in a not really good way. So there's these problems. So my. Uh, a general feeling about expository stuff is, yeah, it's to the extent you can do it kind of honestly and 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 well, that's great. There are a lot of people doing that now, but to the extent that you're just trying to get people excited and enthusiastic by kind of telling them stuff which isn't really true, this is you really shouldn't be doing that. You obviously have a much better intuition about physics. I, I tend to, um, in the space of AI, for example, you could you can use certain kinds of language, like calling things um, intelligent that uh, could rub people the wrong way, but I, I never had a problem with that kind of thing. You know, saying that a program can learn its way without any human supervision as Alpha Zero does to play chess. To me, that um, may not be intelligence, but it sure the, as heck seems like a few steps down the path towards intelligence. Yeah. And, and so like, I think that's a very peculiar uh, property of systems that can be engineered. So even if the idea is fuzzy, even if you're not really sure what intelligence is, or um, like if you don't have a deep fundamental understanding or even a model what intelligence is, if you build a system that sure as heck is impressive and uh, showing some of the signs yeah. of what previously thought impossible for a non-intelligent uh, system, then that's impressive and that's inspiring and yeah. that's okay to celebrate. In physics, because you're not engineering anything, you're just now swimming in the space it, it directly when you do the theoretical physics, that it could be more dangerous. You could be out too far away from shore. Yeah, well, the problem, I think if physics, is it in a, I think it's actually hard for people even to believe or really understand how that, this particular kind of physics has gotten itself into a really unusual and strange and historically unusual state, which is not really, I mean, I, I spent half my life among mathematicians and half among physicists, and you know, mathematics is kind of doing fine. People are making progress and it has all the usual problems, but also, so you could have a, but but you, you just, I just, I don't know, I've never seen anything at all happening in mathematics like what's happened in this specific area in physics. It's just, the kind of sociology of this, the way this field works, banging up against this hard a problem without anything from experiment to help it, it's really, it's led to some, some really kind of problematic things. And those, so it's, it's one thing to kind of, you know, oversimplify or to slightly misrepresent, to try to explain things in a way that's not quite right, but it's another thing to start promoting to people as a successes, ideas which, which which really completely failed, and um, so I mean I, I'm I've kind of a very very specific. You know, if you start have people, <laughs> won't name any names, for instance, coming on certain podcasts like yours, telling the world, you know, this is a huge success and this is really wonderful, and it's just not true, and and this is this this is really problematic, and and it carries a serious danger of um, you know once when people realize that. This is what's going on. You know, they, you know, the, the loss of credibility of of science is, is is a real, real problem for our society. And and you don't want you don't want people to have an all too good reason to, to to think that what they're being what they're being told by kind of some of the best uh, 
institutions in our country and our authority is is is, is not true. You know, is, is is not true. It's a problem. That's that's obviously a characteristic of not just physics. It's uh, it's sociology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, I mean, obviously, in the space of politics, it's that's the history of politics. Is uh, you um, you you sell ideas to, to people even when you don't have any proof that those ideas actually work, yeah. you speak as if they've have worked. And that, that seems to be the case uh, throughout history. Um, and just like you said, it's human beings running up against a really hard problem. I'm not sure if this is like a particular uh, like trajectory through the progress of physics that we're dealing with now, or is it just a natural progress of science? You run up against a really difficult stage of a field and uh, different people that behave differently in the face of that. Yeah. Uh, some sell books and sort of uh, tell narratives that are beautiful and so on. They're not necessarily grounded in um, solutions that have proven themselves. Others kind of uh, put their head down quietly, keep doing the work. Others sort of pivot to different fields and yeah. that's kind of like, yeah, ants scattering. And, and then you have Feels like machine learning, which there's a, there's a few folks mostly scattered away from machine learning in the in the nineties in the winter of AI AI winter as they mm -hmm. call it, but a few people kept their head down and now they're called the fathers of deep learning, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and they didn't think of it that way, um, and in fact if, if there's another AI winter they'll just probably keep working on it anyway, sort of like uh, loyal ants <laughs> to a particular <laughs> oh, sure yeah yeah. So it's 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 interesting, but you're sort of saying that um, we should be careful over hyping things that have not proven themselves, because people will lose trust in the scientific process. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, there's been other ways in which people have lost trust in the scientific process. And that ultimately yeah. has to do actually with all the same kind of behavior as you're highlighting, which is not being honest and transparent about the flaws. Of mistakes of the past. Yeah, I mean that's always a problem. But um, this particular field is kind of fun. It, 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 it's a, it's it's always a strange one. I mean, I think it, in the sense that there's a lot of public fascination with it. That it seems to speak to kind of our deepest questions about you know, what is this physical reality? Where do we come from? And what and these kind of deep issues. So there's there is this unusual fascination with it. Mathematics is for instance very different. Nobody nobody's that interested in mathematics. Nobody really kind of expects to learn really great deep things about the world from mathematics that much. They don't ask mathematicians that. So so, so it, it's a very unusual, it, it, it draws this kind of unusual amount of attention. And it, it really is historically in a, in a really unusual state. It's kind of, it, it's gotten itself way kind of down a, a down a blind alley in, in, a, in, a, in a way which it, it, it's hard to find other historical parallels. To. But sort of to push back a little bit, there's power to inspiring people. And yeah. if I just empirically look, physicists are really good at um, combining science and philosophy and communicating it. Like there's something about physics often that forces you to build a strong intuition about the way reality works, yeah. right? And that allows you to think through sort of and communicate about all kinds of questions. Like if you, see, if you see physicists, it's always fascinating to take on problems that have nothing to do with their particular discipline. Yeah. They think inter in interesting ways and they're able to communicate their thinking in interesting ways. Yeah. And so in some sense, they have a responsibility not just to do science, but to inspire. And not responsibility, but the opportunity. And thereby yeah. I would say a little bit of a responsibility. Yeah, yeah, in some sense, but, um... I don't know. Anyway, it, it's hard to say because 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 different. Um, there, there's many many people doing this kind of thing with different degrees of of, of success and whatever. I I guess one thing. Um, but but I mean, my what's kind of front and center for me is kind of a more parochial interest. Is just kind of what what damage do you do to the subject itself? Ignoring, okay, mis mis misrepresenting, you know, what what a high school students think about string theory, and not that in, doesn't matter much, but but what the smartest undergraduates or the smartest graduate students in the world think about it, 
and what paths you're leading them down and what story you're telling them and what textbooks you're making them read and what they're hearing. And um, and so a lot of what's motivated me is more to try to speak to a kind of a specific population of, of people to make sure that, look, you know, people, it doesn't matter so much what the rest, of, what the average person on the street thinks about string theory, but, you know, what, 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 what the best students at Columbia or Harvard or Princeton or whatever, who are, who, who really want to change work in this field and want to work that way, what, what they know about it, what they think about it, and that they not be go into the field being misled and believing that a certain story, this is where this is all going, this is what I got to do, um, is, is, is that's important to me. Well, in general, for graduate students, for uh, people who seek to be experts in the field, diversity of ideas is really powerful. And yeah. is getting into this local pocket of ideas that people hold on to for several decades is not good. No yeah. matter what the idea, I would say no matter if the idea is right or wrong, oh, yeah, because yeah. there's no such thing as right in the long term. Like it's right for now, <laughs> <laughs> until somebody builds on yeah, yeah. Uh, something much bigger on top of it. It might end up being right, but being a a, a tiny subset of a much bigger thing. So yeah. there, you always should question sort of the uh, the ways of the past. Yeah, yeah. So so how to kind of achieve that kind of diversity of thought and how to within kind of the sociology of how we organize scientific research is, I know this is one thing that I think it's very interesting that uh, Sabina Hassenfelder is very, has interesting things to say about it. And I think also Lee Smolin in his book, which is also about that, I mean, very, I'm very much in agreement with them that there's, anyway, there, there's a really kind of important questions about, you know, how, 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 how research in this field is organized and how people, you know, what can you do to kind of get and get more diversity of thought and get more to, and get people thinking about um, about a wider range of ideas? At the bottom, I think humility always helps. <laughs> well, some, but, but it, the problem is that it's also it's a combination of humility to know when when you're wrong, and also, but also you have to have a you have to have a certain ser very serious lack of humility to believe that you're going to make progress on some of these problems. <laughs>